Joining us now is Oji Okpe with stories trending around the world. Hello, Oji. Good morning, Dr. Abati. <laughs> now we can wave. We can wave. <laughs> the distance yes, is the so distance much. Is perfect. How are you? I'm good. Good morning, Good morning, morning Tundun. How are you? I'm great, thank you. You look lovely. As usual, you do Thank too. you. Good morning to you, viewers. We begin What's Trending in Nigeria. Users on social media have reacted to President Muhammad Buhari's confirmation of Monika Dongban Manson as a substantive president of the appeal court. In a statement released on Monday by Garba Shewu, senior special assistant on media and publicity to the president, Justice Dongban Manson's appointment came after her name was cleared for confirmation by the Senate. Garba Shewu added that her nomination followed the recommendation of the Na National Judicial Commission in line with the provisions of the Constitution. Well, let's take some reactions. One user Charles wrote, all these gaps in tenure are not necessary. The exit date of the last officer was known a year ago. Her substantive replacement should have taken over directly from her. These are critical constitutional roles. Let's avoid acting appointments. I'm least impressed. Another user, Jerry, wrote, I'm glad the president did the right thing. To be honest, in line with President Buhari's way of issuing appointments, I was hope, hoping the beautiful woman would be replaced with a northern Muslim, since that position is a highly sensitive one. Thank you, Mr. President. Finally, a user wrote, good job. Irrespective of ethnicity and religion, the laid down rules must be seen to be applied when transparency is seen in our systems, then lobbyists will have no job to do. The lobbyists are eliminated. The temptation for corrupt practices and subversion of the rule is eliminated. Well, first of all, I'd like to say a huge congratulations. I'm a big fan of Ms. Dongban Manson. Oh, my. It's yes. wonderful news. It's amazing news. I mean, even though it came... Um, <laughs> almost a year later. But a lot of critics are saying that, you know, it's because of how the lawyers had berated the president and, uh, you know, attacked him and made sure that he, that that's why he made sure that he confirmed her as soon as possible. Well, I don't know how. Anyway, let me just come in quickly yes. on this. Rufai, are you with us? Rufai? Yeah. Oh. Yes, I'm with you. Perfect. Okay, Rufai, it's, it's, it's good to know that you are in on this. Hi, Rufai. Now, very quickly, you know, there was some controversy. After yes. Justice Zena Bukachua, uh, retired on March 6. Uh, Justice Dongba Mensem was then appointed in acting capacity. And many Nigerians were worried about whether or not she would be confirmed in that uh, position. Uh, but the explanation that has been given by, uh, by uh, Garuba Shew uh, a few days ago is that first, uh, there were security checks. And that security checks, you know, uh, seem to be taking uh, some time. And many Nigerians were saying, these security checks should not take such a long time, considering long. that the father, Justice Dongba Mensam, is a very senior judicial officer with a lot of experience and who has occupied, you know, uh, important uh, positions. But now uh, the second fear was about uh, ethnicity and religion. Yeah. Uh, there There's was this fear that perhaps that. there was an attempt to bypass her and then like uh, put, uh, you know, somebody who is a Muslim or who is from a particular part of the country in the position. But what everyone should know is that recommendations as to appointments are usually made by the National Judicial Commission. And it's very rare, extremely rare, for the uh, president, you know, to uh, uh, reject the nomination of the uh, National Judicial Commission, except there are extenuating circumstances. But this has been resolved, and it has allayed, in my view, the fears of those who have been complaining about northernization or some kind of mischief involving the appointment of the Justice of the Court of Appeal. And it is good to see that uh, it's a woman who has succeeded yeah. another woman. Yeah. And, you know, uh, we have had a, a female Chief Justice of and Nigeria. The thing we've, is clear. we've now had back-to-back you know, back yeah, a it's female uh, President of the uh, Court of Appeal. Uh, maybe someday in Nigeria we will also have, you know, a woman recognized uh, for her value and uh, achievement, who will become president we will. of Nigeria. We yeah, have to. Maybe we tomorrow to. it will be you. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Why soon do I take no, offense? Rufai <laughs> wanted to say something. I, I, I want to say something. I, I want to quickly say something here. I want to say something. Oh, okay, it's fine. It's fine. Of course it's fine. You wait your turn. Thank you. What I was saying as you were uh, concluding was the fact that Yes, she's been 
confirmed, but it should not have taken one year. I think it's ridiculous. The fact of the matter is that the NJC is the person who names the executive rubber stamps. While President Buhari has his executive order 10 and what have you, trying to stop overreach, he should also attend to his own executive overreach. It is not the place of the executive to abuse that privilege of confirming the appointment of the NJC by leaving her in an acting capacity for one year. It's completely unacceptable. Is it up to one year? Yeah, it's a year. It's almost a year. Uh, uh, so I mean, that's the outrage, really, on that, social that, media. That, um, is Rufai making a comment? Yeah, yeah I want to okay. make a comment. That's just about the point I wanted to pose. Because when you look at the case of the former CJN, it took quite some time before it was finally approved. That's Walter Onoge. And we all know what happened to the former CJN. There's currently a case, Dr. Abati, if you remember, currently going on, too, in Cross River State. That's, I'm not sure the woman has been uh, finally, you know, uh, approved uh, to be able to serve in that capacity. There are some discrepancies about the fact that she's not from Cross River State, uh, that her husband is from Cross River State, and she served in Cross River State for a while. So there are many questions as regards that, and time is of the essence. Because, you see, justice that is delayed sometimes doesn't make the victory sweet in the end. Exactly. Doesn't. All right, well, perfect. Let's take another story. Nigerian House of Reps member from Jigawa State, Mohamed Kazuri, has asked the federal government why it hasn't paid much attention to the killings in the country as it has paid to the coronavirus pandemic. In a now viral video, Mr. Kazuri said that the killings in Nigeria has claimed more lives than coronavirus. Let's take a listen. The speaker, people are talking about coronavirus. How many people coronavirus kill in Nigeria? You are talking about Corona, but we are talking about bandits. In only a single day, they kill the people that, that pass. All the people die with Corona in Nigeria. People they consider this Corona as something. Put your mask, put, block the state, go at home. They lock, they shut down everything. We are not supposed to shut down, we are supposed to shut down this country for banditry, not Corona. Mr. Speaker, the black people are very strong. I don't believe with any corona. No corona will touch me. Look at how we became serious in the issue of corona in this country. Why won't government be serious in the issue of this killing as they treated corona? He got a standing ovation. He deserves one. <laughs> Very well said. But he, he is the one. typical Nigerian who says, Corona cannot touch me. Why are we talking about Corona? I mean, but I think that his point is so valid. His I mean, point we is really well made. need to pay attention to these bandits. It's been yes. ravaging the North for the past, what, since 2003? I mean, it's ridiculous at this point. It really is. Well, yeah. you know, on uh, May 28, uh, usually you know, before May 29, a group of civil society organizations, uh, including Enough is Enough, which is led by uh, yeah, Jamie Adam of uh, This Day Live, um, you know, they try to prioritize certain issues for the attention of government in the expectation that the federal government would address that issue on the occasion of May uh, 29. This year, when they issued a press statement and had an event, they were saying more or less something similar uh, to what this uh, particular gentleman was saying. And they tried to show that a lot of people have died since sure. January this year on account of the challenge of insecurity in different parts of the uh, country. And they provided the statistics. But what is the message? I mean, the uh, uh, lawmaker was a bit uh, histrionic in his presentation. But the principal point that he's making is that, look, we may have coronavirus, but also we have the challenge of insecurity. And we cannot drop the ball on that. And if you look at what has been happening in the Northwest, uh, in the North Central, particularly in Southern Cardinal, and also in the Northeast, it is very clear that Nigeria still faces the challenge of insecurity. However, uh, Femi Adishina addressing this on the occasion of May uh, 29 says that it is work in progress. And I guess from him, that's an assurance that government, uh, the federal government is fully aware that insecurity remains a problem. Correct. I mean, very well said there. Uh, we cannot forget the fact that we've lost a lot of lives to insecurity in this country. 
but that also shouldn't mitigate uh, the case of coronavirus, which is another very important one. I think we need to look at all these issues pari passu and ensure that we get to the end at the bottom of all of this. Very well said, Rufai. Let's take another story still in Nigeria. The Kogi state government has claimed that the first COVID-19 case announced in the state only had complications from a bee sting. According to the Commissioner for Information and Communication, King Seifongo, the index case never saw a result confirming his diagnosis of the disease. The Nigerian Center for Disease Control announced two index cases for Kogi on May 27th. And Abubakar Ahmed, the chief imam of Kaba, turned out to be one of the two index cases of COVID-19 in the state. The commissioner added that the state debriefed the imam who has, who has been discharged and were shocked to discover that his experiences in the hands of the NCDC were far from everything that Nigerians had been told constitute the best practices in a COVID-19 situation. <laughs> First, I mean, the NCDC has to answer to this allegation. It's a huge allegation. I mean, we need to know what really happened there. It is. There's an element of farce in the way Kogi State has approached certain things. But it must be said that before we completely dismiss the fact that Kogi State is back on the offensive, it has to be said that other people have complained about how they were put in True. isolation centers and they were negative, how test results students. were never yes. presented to them. There are some stories that yeah. have been going around that do not leave the, mo the best impression and yeah. don't create st a lot of confidence in yeah. the NCDC. So you're completely right. They should address it. They have to. Well, a number of points. One, the NCDC, through uh, its director general, Dr. Chikwe Hekwazu, had had cause to make it clear um, at a point that the NCDC does not give results of tests uh, to individuals, that they only collate the numbers. And I guess he made that statement at the time that uh, uh, Chief Dopesi, High Chief uh, Raymond Dopesi and his son, uh, who had been treated and had been discharged, raised a question about you know, whether or not they were not entitled to a copy of the result of the test that they went through. Secondly, I, I read an article this morning uh, in one of the newspapers, in The Nation, to be precise, written by Professor Latin Jidari, who is a very senior and highly respected, uh, distinguished journalist. And it's from Kogi State, in which he's saying that what we're witnessing in Kogi State is a series of stunts uh, being put in place by uh, the governor and his uh, aides, and that uh, Kogi State will take the prize for what he describes as coronavirus 419. <laughs> so <laughs> we are not just talking about COVID-19. Yes. You know, we now have this new invention call, called coronavirus 419. Yes. And Kogi State uh, seems to be the headquarters of it. Well, that's what, the elements of farce. What we should be saying <laughs> to uh, the governor of Kogi State is that, look, this thing is not a joke. It's serious. I mean. And it should cooperate and collaborate with the relevant uh, departments, the Federal Ministry of Health, the uh, NCDC, and even the health workers in the state who have had cause to protest that the governor is not handling the situation in Kogi State very well. Okay. When, when Dr. Bati said coronavirus 419, what came to my mind was COVID-19 419. <laughs> I like that one. COVID-19-419. <laughs> <COVID> <laughs> That's anyway, a good one. I think we yes, should take a break take now. A short break. So when we return, what's trending? We'll continue. Welcome back to the morning show here on the Arise News channel. We're still on stories trending around the world with OG Okpe. <laughs> Keep laughing, I love it. <laughs> well, let's take another story. The president of Tanzania, John Magufuli, has declared the country COVID-19 free, attributing the development to prayers and fasting from the citizens. Speaking during a church service in Dodma, the country's capital, the president said God has answered the prayers of the citizens and eliminated the disease in the country. The president lauded the clerics and worshippers for not using gloves and masks for protection from the disease. You know, since April, the government stopped publishing figures of COVID-19 infections in the country. The last known figure of confirmed cases in Tanzania was 509 with 21 deaths. 
while Twitter users have shared mixed reactions. Let's take some tweets. One user wrote, there's zero testing. Disregard to WHO guidelines, e.g. social distancing and wearing masks. No transparency in availing data. And if it is truly as a result of God's intervention, they should do the same for malaria, HIV, and other infectious diseases. Let's not mock God. Another user wrote, I don't understand the recklessness of some of our leaders. If the government is not very careful in the way of handling the disease, then Africa might end up being the epic center of COVID-19 by the month of September. In Tanzania, things might turn out like they are in Brazil right now. Finally, a user wrote, Africans, we are still mentally colonized because it's Tanzania. Everyone is busting with critics and childish blames. If it was a Western nation, you'd all be cool and send praise. This racism we have for fellow Africans is scary. Congratulations, Mr. President. Well, I don't think that this is a case of racism. This is clearly a case of irresponsible leadership. <laughs> and President John Magufuli has not uh, provided the uh, kind of leadership that is required in the face of this pandemic. In April, he ordered that there should be no further publication of uh, data regarding uh, the seroprevalence of COVID-19 in Tanzania. As at that time, Tanzania had 509 uh, cases. Yes. Now, and since then, there's been no testing. There's been no attempt to track. And his excuse, the president's excuse, is that if you keep announcing the numbers, you will cause panic and fear among the uh, populace. His own son uh, tested positive for COVID-19. He recovered. Uh, he also received the donation from uh, Madagascar of the herbal mixture called, called uh, COVID organics. We don't know whether that has been administered on anybody. So now, yesterday in Dodoma, the president said, oh, he was thanking religious leaders in Tanzania for their prayers, and that uh, God has answered their prayers. I, he, he got to know that, I do not know, and that in Tanzania, God has eliminated uh, coronavirus. Uh, the uh, fear is that President Magufuli, with the kind of rhetorics, with the kind of uh, attitude that he has adopted, is endangering the lives of Tanzanians. Because yes. even yesterday, he was telling them, don't wear masks. I mean, can you imagine I that? Understand and he was saying that if any donor really? gives you a mask, don't collect the mask. <laughs> Tell them to go and give to their wives and their children. I, I, I don't understand. Something new always comes out of Africa. And Magufuli is a new discovery. I mean, he... <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, it's just jaw-droppingly irresponsible of him to say. I was shocked when I read the story. He sounds like those it. poor misguided deers who go into a den of lions because Daniel did in the Bible and nothing happens to him and they end up getting swallowed by Mufasa and Simba. <laughs> That's exactly what he sounds like. But unfortunately, he's the president, he's the leader of a country. Again and again, we see that elections matter. We have to watch the caliber of people that we elect into the highest office. Of course, prayer and fasting works. But is he trying to suggest that God is only a God in Tanzania and other mm. countries there's well, no prayer and said. fasting? But then you remember that there was it's one ridiculous. time that he did announce that people were going to do, a, is it a two-week fasting every Sunday for coronavirus? Yeah, that was what, what he was referring yeah, to. Yeah, but why did he do it for HIV? Yes, why did he and people do, 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 do that, that all over the world. Prayer and fasting has its role that it plays, but so <laughs> do following, you know, wearing your mask and, you know, hand sanitizing and hand hygiene protocols. Of course mm. you must observe that. It's completely absurd. <laughs> Rufai. Rufai. You know, Tundu, the words of your dad, M.K. Abiola, comes to mind here, that if a man rehearses madness for 20 years, when will he start practicing the madness? <laughs> uh, when will Magufuli start practicing the madness? But it's obvious that Magufuli has started practicing his madness now. At first, you come out to say that you are coronavirus free. Who declared you coronavirus free? The health authorities or you? So it's just a magufulication of Tanzania <laughs> that has caused a lot of problems for that country. And it, it's, a, it, it's leaders like this that make Africa look like a joke. Something has to be done. The African <laughs> Union needs to step in and talk to this man. Leaders like this make Africa look like a joke. Well, Rufai uh, Tundu and uh, Oji, well, I hope you know that uh, we're lucky we're not in Tanzania, yes. where this kind of free speech uh, is not allowed. And that's another big problem 
uh, that Magufuli has imposed on that country. Incidentally, it started well, but then it went round the yeah, bend. Now, they often start well. now yes. we, we have a dangerous situation whereby even health officials in the country, Minister of Health, head of uh, this health department or the other, they are now echoing the president because there is repression they are scared. in Tanzania. They are scared. And the real fear scared. is the fear of the freedom to say the truth. But you know there are reports, even like for him, it's quite embarrassing. There are reports of people that are going into different neighboring countries that have been confirmed with COVID-19. No, and in fact, the neighboring countries, Kenya, Uganda, yes. Zambia, you know, these countries have had to close their borders they have. to prevent uh, people from Tanzania uh, coming into their uh, areas yes, so that they don't is, become super spreaders. Disgrace. Yes, it's so completely embarrassing. embarrassing for us. I mean, I don't understand. I think he should retract the statement and try to figure out. And also, wasn't it the same people that, um, wasn't it Tanzania that took out the uh, WHO from their country no, as that's well? Burundi. Burundi as that's well. Burundi. But they also had issues. And you know that the president, during this whole pandemic period, he had asked people to raise prices of goods and services because of coronavirus. I mean, how can a president do that? We just get things backwards sometimes in Africa. This reminds me of the horrible reports, where incidents, not just reports, where um, Ebola, with the Ebola crisis, health workers were being murdered. They were being attacked and killed. People trying to help were being murdered because the people in that neighborhood thought they were lying, spreading disease. Why do we get things backwards sometimes? Bad. Well, should we take our final story? Sure. Formula One champion Lewis Hamilton has backed anti-racism demonstrators who tore down a statue of a 17th century slave owner, Edward Coulson, in Bristol, southwest England on Sunday. The six-time world champion took to his Instagram on Monday and posted a video of the protesters pulling down the statue with the caption, I do not condone violence or criminal acts, but... You have had plenty of time to do this yourself and haven't power to the people. Protesters used ropes to rip down the monument of Carlson, a local merchant who made the bulk of his fortune from the slave trade in the late 1600s. I mean, I'm very proud of Lewis Hamilton and everyone who's been um, raising their voice for this protest. I mean, Lewis Hamilton has been quite vocal, even challenging the government of England and, you know, talking about um, starting from even the coronavirus pandemic or how they have not handled it properly in the UK. And also the fact that, you know, um, these statues have been in England for years. And if this whole protest and demonstration for Black Lives Matter didn't happen, the statues will not have been taken down. They might it's have almost done. like, wh why do you think so? It's been there but, for yes, a while. It's been there for a while, but there was a petition. I think it's better to just do the le go things, go the legal route at all times rather than this mob action of taking down the statue as reprehensible as it is, as disgusting as the transatlantic African slave trade is, and anybody who profited from it is revolting. But there was a petition. So that, I think, would have been the better course of action, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, well, oh, I mean, <clears throat> the protest about <clears throat> racist symbols, as uh, Tundo pointed out, didn't start today. In, yes. in the particular case of Edward Coastings uh, statue, that has been part of the conversation within the community. Yes. That statue has been there since 1895. But it has taken, you know, the uh, Black Lives Matter protest uh, for the people to have their way. Uh, resort to self-help is not the right route to go anywhere. Yeah. But apart from Edward Colston, we also have in London the statue of uh, Winston Churchill uh, being defaced. And this whole conversation around the legacy of slave trade or apartheid or racism or equality is not just in Europe, it's everywhere. Um, but the only concern that I see here is what does it do for the value of history? Because some of these monuments, you may have objections to them, ideological or emotional objections, but they also constitute an aspect of human history. Is so issue. when you I'm pull down statues that, yes. or you say you don't want a particular symbol, then, of course, you may be raising a significant part of yeah, human this is, history. This is not the way to go. Yeah. Because Lewis Hamilton was even saying all racist symbols around the world 
should be pulled down. I do agree with him. I'm sorry. Okay. I do agree with him. I don't see any reason why they should be monuments. And they okay. Yeah, but then there should be a petition the and take yes. them down. Okay. I, I, I okay. agree with that okay. aspect too okay. as well. With I, the I, but can I, can I, mean, I come in here? Can, okay, can I come in here? Uh, I, I stayed in Bristol for a bit, so I know that statue very well, the Colson statue. Colson doesn't only have a statue in Bristol named after him. There are schools in Temple Mead in Street. Bristol named after him. There's, yeah. a, there's a hall named after him. There's a tower named yes. after him and the likes. What do you want to do with all that? Like you said very strongly, we need to do things the right way. And I also want to be very controversial. If we're fighting transatlantic trade and we say trade money, uh, slave trade money we don't want, how about Rhodes Scholars? Should Rhodes Scholars start returning exactly. the money to Cecil, Cecil Rhodes? Rhodes? That's a big yes. question we should answer. Even Winston Churchill, Even as Winston... revolting as his racism yeah. is, I don't agree with that defacing of his senators, as gross as some of his statements are. He was, he was a racist. But vandalism is never the answer. Yes. All right, well... Okay, thank you very much, Oji. Thank you, Tundun. See you guys tomorrow. Thank you, Rafai.